Nappy here. You are tuned in to HCAM Sports Talk Live. Thank you for joining us. And today on the show, we have the Hopkinton Hillers Alpine Ski Team. And uh, we have the captains joining us as well as the coaches. So let's go around the table and we'll have everyone introduce themselves and talk about what they do on the team. We'll start off with Nancy. Hi, I'm Coach Nancy. I have been the head coach of the Hopkins Ski Team for five years, and I work with new racers and advanced racers every winter to see how far we can push it and how fast we can get on the hill. Terrific. Uh, and how about Daniel? Hi, this is Dan Barry. I'm the assistant coach. I help out Nancy. I've been working side by side with Nancy since the team formed uh, five years ago. And uh, I help Nancy sort of optimize the time on the hill for the kids so that the racers are getting the best out of their training time on the hill and help coordination on the races as well. Excellent. And um, how about C. Barry? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Kate. I'm a senior at Hoppington High School, and this is my second year being a captain um, on the ski team. Terrific. Uh, Jackson. Hi, I'm Jackson. I'm one of three captains, first year captain, four-year racer for high school, and I'm excited to be on snow. Terrific. And last but not least, Tori. Hi, I'm Tori. I'm a junior, and this is my second year on the team, and I'm a captain this year. Excellent. So uh, first off to um, the captains out there, how long have you been skiing for? Uh, what got you into skiing? Um, just talk about your background in uh, skiing a little bit. Uh, we'll start off with Kate. Um, I have been skiing for pretty much as long as I can remember. Um, I got into skiing um, because my dad, he was a skier um, when he grew up and through his life. So that's how I got into skiing. Um, and then I got into ski racing at a pretty young age as well. And then I just stuck with it all these years. Terrific. How about you, Jackson? Uh, pretty much after I started walking, my mom taught me how to ski. Uh, true story. Nasker. And then... I kind of, we moved to New England. There's not very good snow here. So we decided the best way to maintain skiing was to join racing. So around six or seven, I joined the Wachusa Mountain Race Team. And then as soon as I entered high school, the new team was starting up and I thought it was a great opportunity to combine my love of high school sports with my love of skiing. All right, how about Tori? Um, so my story is a little bit different. I was a swimmer for a really long time and I had skied recreationally and for fun um, since I was pretty little. But um, after my freshman year swimming for the high school swim team, I decided that I was getting a little bored with swimming. So Nancy encouraged me to join the ski team and I'm back this year and I'm really loving it. Terrific. All right. Well, um, this ski program just got started up recently uh, for the coaches. Could you talk about the history of the program a little bit and how it ended up getting started? Sure. Dan and I have been around since the uh, first idea of having a ski team for high school. Um, we had a bunch of parents from uh, Wachusett mountain race team in the area. And we had little ones at the time. And we thought it would be fun when they got big enough for high school that it would be great to have a high school ski program. So we started pursuing what that would mean and how to start one. And it was about a three year um, process of learning how to start a high school team with MIAA. We went to many meetings, talked to a lot of uh, administrators, talked to a lot of the leagues around the area to find out if we could be a good fit and what it would take to start a team. Um, Hopkinton um, worked through the process with us and five years ago we got the green light from them and we got a green light from our league and um, ski ward and we just started rolling from there. Um, I've been coaching for about 10 years now so it was an easy fit to help out and get a coach for the high school and work with these kids from all different backgrounds to give them a winter sport that's outside the building and with a lot of fresh air around. It's terrific. And uh, this program has come a long way in the last couple of years. 
Um, I understand you finished second place in a couple of meets so far this season. Can you talk about how this year has gone? This year has been phenomenal for us. Um, we have a huge group of seniors on the team that have been with us for four years. We've got some great juniors that have been with us for a couple of years, um, two to three years at this point, and a few new people, um, freshmen and sophomores, jumping into the sport for the first time. So it's been um, a good mix of recreational skiers and racers. And um, better or worse, the weather has kind of been on our side. I don't want to say that too loudly because we still have a couple more weeks left. And so um, the format that we adapted for um, COVID year to keep social distancing and keep the kids racing has worked well. It's been great to see a crew of Hopkinton come down the hill and they're supporting each other wonderfully. So um, this last week, um, we again finished with our top girl and top boy for our pod night, our league pod, that would be Kate and Jackson. And then um, the girls team also um, stayed strong in second place and the boys have taken over first place. That's terrific. Um, and how, how, how much has this program grown uh, since you've started it? It seems like the roster just keeps getting bigger and bigger. It has. We went from a let's try and see what we can do and get what kids are interested. And we were thinking maybe five or six um, high school racers. Um, but and we've always had low girl numbers. Um, Kate has been one of the two founding members of the team for the girls team, which has now grown to nine girls, which has been great over the years to see the growth in the girls um team on that league and the boys we've had a pretty steady group of boys anywhere up to 16 boys this year we're a little lower because we had to keep our numbers down but um, we are becoming one of the bigger teams in our league which is great to see we want to get more kids on the hill and more kids having a winter sport that they can do we're a non-cut sport so we welcome all abilities of skiers to join us and take on this new adventure so even if you're like me and you're totally inexperienced and not too good, you could join the team. Yeah. Dan and I have always said, as long as you can get on and off a chairlift and ski and get down a blue slope, we can work with you at ski ward. <laughs> <laughs> My best abilities in skiing are uh, skiing backwards and not on purpose and running into people. Cause I can't. Perfect. Stop. <laughs> You'll fit right in. <laughs> uh, Nancy and Daniel, can you talk about your background in skiing a little bit? And, um, what encouraged you uh, to end up wanting to uh, coach this program? Uh, we'll start off with Nancy. Oh, I was going to let Dan talk. Um, <laughs> I have been skiing since I was a middle schooler. Um, I pursued my degree as an outdoor education. So I've been a big time backcountry skier, telemark skier, and mountaineer. Um, moved out west, fell in love with the Rocky Mountains did a lot of instruction of skiing out there. I became a PSI ski instructor when I was out there as well. And when we moved east, I um, started looking at race teams and volunteering with them and brought my children into those race teams and started getting my um, coaching hat on and learning how to coach. And it's grown since then. I've um, become a multiple certified USA race coach and I've been teaching um, young adults or young children and budding adults how to ski race for about 10 years now. That's terrific. How about you, Daniel? Yeah, so some, uh, pretty similar to Nancy. I grew up in, in Western Mass where, where skiing was just a part of life from a very young age. I remember in elementary school going to the after school programs out of a little hill called Bosque and uh, Jiminy Peak out in Western Mass and Brody, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, so I've skied my entire life. Um, I too spent some time out West in Colorado when I was in the service. So I got the a taste of the, the mountains out there for many years and absolutely loved it. Uh, and then came back here. And, um, you know, when my children were born, Kate and her younger daughter, Allie, who's also a racer on the team, um, I just wanted to get them involved in the sport as, as young as possible because that's the best time to learn. Uh, so we did that and, you know, we just sort of happened into the racing, into the racing circuit. They took to it quickly. Uh, they love it. And uh, once they got old enough and joined a USSA team, the, the Wachusa team, um, I received my USSA certification as a coach as well. Um, you know, met Nancy and, you know, saw we had very similar interests in terms of getting a team going in Hopkinton and, and the rest is history. That's terrific. And uh, this season we have been airing 
uh, the home ski meets on HCAM. And for those that don't know, because we get a lot of viewers tuning in, can someone just talk about how these meets work? Uh, what exact what exactly is involved in a different types of contests? Sure, Dan, correct me if I go astray on this one, because this year's a little different. <laughs> what we've been doing this year, if you're tuning into HCAM, is we have broken up our 10 teams that usually race at Ski Ward, which used to be on Thursdays. We've broken up into two pods. So we have five teams um, racing on Tuesday nights, and we have five teams on Thursday nights. So HCAM has been following us, the Hopkinton, which were a Thursday night um, pod, and there's five other high schools, or a total of five. We have um, Westboro, King Phillips, Algonquin, and Medway is our high school pods that we're racing with. It's a little different than the Tri-Valley League. And it's we used to um, kind of zipper the kids that all the top kids from each team would go first. And then we do a different seed list to get everybody on the hill. This year we're racing as a high school. So all my girls and boys line up together. We have two courses going and 30 seconds between a racer, they're coming down the hill. So, um, and we rotate through the rotation with the five teams. Like we started in the last position at our first race, which was number five. And now this coming week, we're gonna be in position one. So if you tune in early for HCAM, you're gonna get Hopkinton right off the bat coming down the hill at you. All right, so there it is, tune in. Well, right at seven, right? Yep. All right, that's terrific. Um, so to the captains out there, uh, what are some of the things that uh, you've worked on to get ready for this season? And obviously we had the whole uh, pandemic situation, so I'm sure that uh, limited time at some resorts, but what are some of the things that you do in the preseason to get ready and maybe some of the skills that you're working on for this season? Uh, we can start off with Kate. Um, going into my senior year, and especially with the limited amount of skiing available, um, I've really just been trying to work on a positive mindset, um, especially with all the different things that are going on and how it's been different um, from past years. So I guess um, this preseason, I was just working on going into it with a positive mindset and then keeping that positive mindset. Um, but skills wise, I've just been looking to um, be aggressive in the course and stick with it all the way, even if I have a tough run. Um, I've been looking just to keep up my strength and um, just make it make it through the course as fast as possible. <laughs> That's terrific. Positive mindset, certainly important. How about you, Jackson? What are some of the things you've been working on? For the preseason, my main goal was to get as much skiing in as possible. Uh, given the limited amount of conditions we had early on, we weren't able to set as many gates and courses as we would like to train. So I focused on doing as much runs on the slopes and working off the course on what I can do in the course to help. And I've been accomplishing that by not only training with high school, but training outside of high school and going up on weeknights to other mountains to uh, get runs in. Terrific. Uh, is there any particular mountain that you go to that's your favorite? Uh, I can't really name favorites, but the closest one that would be worth training at is uh, Wachusett. It's only about an hour, 40 minutes away, 40, 50. So it's a, it's a good drive to a slope ratio. Excellent. Uh, Tori, how about you? What are some of the things you've been working on to get ready for the season and some of the things you're working on throughout the season? Yeah, you know, COVID restrictions have made it hard this season to travel um, like between states. So I can't really go up to like Vermont or New Hampshire to train some of the mountains up there. So I've been trying to, you know, ski at Jiminy Peak and Wachusett just to get in mountain time. Um, and then also I run cross country in the fall. So kind of continuing running, doing like outside workouts, just trying to be as prepared as possible for when I do have like actual training time open. Um, and then also in terms of like COVID restrictions, like our season hasn't really changed all too much to altogether. Um, so, you know, we're really grateful that we still have a lot of opportunities and that our AD is working really hard to make sure that we have like the best season we possibly can, keeping it fun and competitive and getting us as much time as possible out on the mountain. And you must certainly be happy to be out there uh, this year. 
for sure. All right. So um, to the coaches, I'm curious. So let's say somebody's coming into this program inexperienced. What's some of the first advice that you would give an inexperienced skier? Uh, we'll start off with Daniel for this one. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a great, great question, Tom. Um, you know, I, I'd say uh, grit and persistence pays off. Um, you know, I think I think Kate may have alluded to this uh, in, in one of the earlier questions, but this is a sport that can be very difficult. Um, the technical aspects of it are very difficult, but you're also contending with other things like the elements. You know, it can be very cold, like it was last night during the race. It can be windy. It can be too warm. The snow can be sticky. It can be icy. There are all sorts of things um, that you can point to to make it difficult. Um, but the challenge in this sport is recognizing what those variables are, making the necessary adjustments and then doing the best you can because everybody else is contending with those same challenges. So I would say, uh, you know, persistence and grit is, goes a long way and can compensate for, you know, lack of racing experience in the past. That's, I think that's very good advice right there. Uh, Nancy, uh, how about you? What's some of the advice you would give uh, an inexperienced skier? Well, on top of everything that Dan says, just to keep with it, it's not going to come easy. You're going to wind up with bruises. You're going to wind up falling. But the fact that you get back up and you try again is going to pay off in huge dividends because we do two different kinds of courses. We do GS and slalom. GS is a speed course, which a lot of um, even beginner racers can uh, manage because it's just kind of mind over matter to get around the gates and go as fast as you can. When we get into a slalom, it's really technical and a lot of recreational skiers um, are not used to turning that quickly. So what I love about our recreational skiers that come into it is when they see slalom, they want to learn it. They want to figure it out. They know it's not going to be easy, but just keep getting after it and keep trying new things. And we're here to help and give them advice, but it's ultimately them in the gates in the snow with whatever conditions are going to get thrown at them. So these guys are pretty tough by the end of the season. Anybody who's done ski racing, they know it could come and go just like a snap of a finger for how that run went. So. Absolutely. I could, I know from personal experience, it takes a whole lot of practice. That's for sure. Um, so to the captains, um, any future plans to ski perhaps after your Hiller's days or perhaps uh participate in any other sports uh, at the co collegiate level or something like that. Uh, Tori. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm still a junior. So I luckily have another year on the team next year. Um, but the colleges that I am looking at are mostly in the North or colder places. So I'm hoping to ski, you know, maybe recreationally or club skiing, something like that, but for sure. Terrific. How about you, Jackson? Uh, I'm trying to keep an optimist mindset right now because I'm not quite sure what next year will look like for, for sports in college, but um, it, it would be nice to join a club, and I kind of feel like I'm heading in that direction. Terrific. And how about you, Kate? Um, I definitely have a pretty similar view on it um, this, as Jackson does. I'm um, really just trying to focus on where I'm going to go to college first, and right. then I can decide <laughs> if I um, am going to ski for um, a club or anything like that, or, but I'll definitely keep up. I'm skiing for skiing for fun. I'll definitely keep that up. Terrific. Uh, well, I know you are all uh, very skilled out there and uh, getting some good results. And it's certainly been fun to watch on H cam. I saw in a couple of weeks, it said there was a championship meet, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, can anybody explain what that's about? The coaches are actually getting together um, tonight to discuss how we can do uh, pod championships because this year MIA is not doing any championships and we can't cross over pods. So it could be on our last night before, I think it's the 11th or 12th, actually it's the 11th of February. We'll have some kind of way to celebrate the season. So more to come on that. We'll have more details by next week. But we also want to thank HCAM because um, not only our family and friends who cannot come to the bottom of the hill to cheer on, enjoying watching this, but we have a lot of um, grandparents across the country that are tuning in. 
And what I've seen from our racers is after a day of racing, they go home to watch what they did on the hill. So they're using the videotape to critique their performances. So that's a great benefit to having you guys out there videotaping for us. <laughs> it's become a great training tool, Tom. So I, I concur. I got a great shout out to HCAM. It's worked out really well for us this year, and we appreciate the time. I bet. Well, we certainly uh, enjoy doing it, and it seems like this program's only going to get bigger from here. Um, so congratulations to uh, you two coaches, uh, Nancy and Daniel, for the terrific work you've done at uh, developing this program and uh, making it get bigger as the years go on. And uh, congratulations to the captains for leading the way for this Alpine ski program. Seems like it has a very bright future, uh, but I want to thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. And welcome back to HCAM Sports Talk. We hope you enjoyed our interview with the Hopkinton Hillers Alpine Ski Team. And uh, they just had a great meet as for the first time in program history, the boys finished in first place. Uh, first time in program history. So impressive stuff. And the girls finished in second place during the last meet. So they are having a, a very successful season. So we hope you enjoyed that interview. And if you want to go back and rewatch it, it's available on our website, hcam.tv, as well as our YouTube page. But of course, I'm Tom Nappy. And today I am joined by Mike Terosian. We have Jared Keen and Andy Barron. We'll be talking about a number of topics, but there is a big football game coming up. So we'll be talking a whole lot about that. We'll, we'll talk some uh, Super Bowl props. There's some very interesting props. I was looking at the, uh, the list of uh, all the props and there's like 12 pages worth. So we'll talk about some of those and what we think is going to happen in the big game. But first, we just want to recap a couple of pieces of information that you should know about in case you don't already. We talked about this last week on the show, but the uh, Boston Marathon has... They've picked a date. It'll be uh, Monday, October 11th for the Boston Marathon. So Monday, October 11th, the expected date of the 125th Boston Marathon. And we're certainly hoping that we'll see a marathon in October. Uh, we certainly missed it last year. And also, we have some games coming up live on our HCAM Ed channel, as well as our YouTube page, youtube.com slash HCAM TV. Now, as many of you probably know by now, the games have been getting moved around like crazy throughout this winter season. The opponents have been getting moved around, but they're finding a way to get these games in. So this schedule is subject to change, but this is the intended broadcast schedule for the rest of the week. Of course, tonight we'll have Hiller's Girls Varsity Hockey against Norwood. That's a 7 p.m. start time. And then, uh, and they weren't even originally supposed to play Norwood. They were originally supposed to play Medway, but unfortunately Medway had a shutdown. So Norwood stepped in. And then on Thursday, February 4th, 7 p.m., we have Alpine skiing over in Shrewsbury. John Ritz will be there broadcasting the Alpine ski meet. And then also we have some girls basketball coming up on Thursday against Westwood. And this is the makeup games that were supposed to take place on Tuesday, but obviously the snowstorm changed those plans. So on Thursday, we'll have the freshman game at 3.30. We'll have the JV game at 5 p.m. And we'll have the varsity game at 6.30 p.m. You can catch them all right here on HCAM over on our HCAM Ed channel as well as our YouTube page. And then Friday, February 5th, even more basketball against Westwood. And this time it's boys basketball versus Westwood. Same deal. Freshman at 3.30, JV at 5, and varsity at 6.30. And then our exciting week of sports concludes with Hiller's boys varsity hockey. They'll take on Westwood. That's a 1.40 p.m. game over at the New England Sports Center this coming Saturday. We'll have that game live for you on HCAM as well. So a loaded rest of the week with Hiller Sports. And guess what? They've already uh, rescheduled some of the games that they had to postpone earlier in the year. So we got about two more weeks left of uh, Hiller Sports in the winter season as that winter season will go to um, at least uh, February 22nd or 22nd. February 20th, yeah. something like that. But uh, in any case, it's going to be a fun few weeks, and hopefully they get these games in and we don't get too much more snow and 
Everybody lives happily ever after. <laughs> but in any case, uh, we want to talk some Super Bowl today. The big game coming up this Sunday. Tom Brady going to the Super Bowl for his 10th time in his career with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers this time. Of course, that's his first time with Tampa Bay. And they'll be taking on the Kansas City Chiefs. So uh, why don't we relive our Super Bowl picks? Here they are right oh, here. Oh, come on, I Tom. Love right? no. I, I know Jared doesn't want to show. see these. <laughs> uh, my favorite part of the show. Thanks, Tom. Jared's eliminated. He, he's long gone. Um, Andy's still in. He could pick the correct winner. Uh, but he technically can't win because he has the wrong NFC opponent. Right. <laughs> uh, Kevin technically can't win because he has the wrong AFC opponent. But he could pick the right winner. Uh, and then you have Mike, who has both teams still alive. And Bob, of course. I mean, you had to figure Bob was going to pick the Super Bowl, right? Yes. And myself. So we're, we're all uh, very much alive. So there they are. There's a little age cam conspiracy here going on big, with, uh, with all three of you guys picking the same staff. exact matchup. <laughs> I, I, I think it's a well-educated age cam staff, I think. Yeah. But I think touché, Mike. Touche, Mike. Touche. Oh, it doesn't matter because Bob, Bob wins. He wins the tiebreaker over me, anyways, because Green Bay yeah. stunk two weeks ago. So, <laughs> well, he picked a ties at one point, so we should just give him the win anyway. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> what if well, Bob picks the Browns like to win the Super Bowl next year? It's going to be like we, we can never we can never bet against him again. I mean, if he does, you know, yeah, I, I might throw some money retired. on him if he does that. <laughs> or if like the Lions did, or. Uh, you know, now that they hey, got uh, Jared Goff. So. That's a good prop to start with. Uh, fi- uh, what an outrageous trade that was, by the way. That What, what a ridiculous trade. I, I've never seen a more ridiculous trade, I think. I don't know. Yeah, well, I, mean, I want to get into on. that, uh, the Goff for uh, Stanford, uh, Stafford trade, because that was interesting. But just so you know, the favorite to win the Super Bowl next year is the Kansas City Chiefs, 5-1 to one odds. No surprise. Packers yeah, are the Packer. – Packers are 17-2. to two. <laughs> And then the Bills and Bucks are 10 to 1. And then you have Seahawks and Ravens at 12 to 1. Uh, the Patriots, 50 to 1. That's, I think, the lowest odds about right. had in the Belichick era. Wow. And then let's see, where's the Browns since you mentioned them? They're 20 to 1. Okay. So they're not, bad. not too bad. And then the worst odds are the Jets, 150 to 1. Of course, oh. no surprise there. And that's. The uh, second worst, Texans, Lions, Bengals, all 100 to 1. So, yeah, I'm surprised. I mean, I figured the odds for Texans would be bad, but I didn't think they'd be in the same group with the Lions and Bengals. But anyway, speaking of the Detroit Lions, they made a big trade this past week uh, with the Los Angeles Rams, formerly known as the St. Louis Rams, as they traded Matthew Stafford for Jared Goff uh, and the – Rams also uh, got a – or no, the Lions also got a handful of some draft picks as well. Picks, yeah, yeah. Uh, Two was future first firsts round? and a third. Say that again? Two future first rounders and a third rounder. Wow. That's pretty good stuff. That's I think – I mean, come on, man. I think the Lions made out – or uh, the Rams made out, I mean, getting all those draft picks. No, the – the Lions made out, man. The oh, Lions, that's what I meant. All right, I'm getting yeah. confused. The Lions are the ones who got all the draft picks and golf. Uh, I think what are the, what are the Rams out. thinking, honestly? What, what what are honestly the Rams thinking? You I, know, Stafford. I mean, Stafford's slightly better than Goff, but not that not much by better. much. Yeah, uh, Jared Goff had a pretty good year, and he actually proved he's he's a pretty tough guy. Yeah, he pre- pretty much played with a a broken thumb or whatever. I mean, but it, it's clear to me the Rams are. They're all in because let's face it, they still have a really good offense and a really good defense. Stafford, I think he's a little bit better too. So they're, they're clearly going all in. I mean, to, to compete in the NFC, there's no there's no doubt about it. They must have just really wanted Stafford out of there to give up all of that. They gave up so much for him, though. I mean, again, Stafford is a good quarterback. I'm not saying Stafford is a bad quarterback by any means. Um, I I agree that he's probably slightly better than Goff, but to also have two future first rounders and a third rounder in there. Yeah. I don't know, man. That just seemed that, that just seems ridiculous. And to now me. with with Goff going to Detroit, he's got eight games in a dome. I mean that that's probably gonna help him, honestly. Yeah. I mean, well, they'll have to play a couple of cold games, you know, maybe in Green Bay and Chicago, but then he but then he plays uh two uh, um, a game in Minnesota too. So he actually plays nine games. You know, the Lions, I mean, 
I don't know. Maybe they just uh, – well, it clearly says to me now, Matt Stafford did not want to come to the – that was the one team he said he would not play for as the Patriots. What a surprise. You know? That's no surprise to me. He doesn't like Matt Patricia. There I don't go. think anybody in the Lions did. Yeah. You know, everyone's going nuts. Oh, he said he doesn't want to play for the Patriots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this going to become a habit? No, it was Matt Patricia. Yeah. His former head coach was there, and he hates the guy, so that's why he didn't want to go to the Pats. If Matt Patricia wasn't there, I don't think he would have said that. Unless Probably he has not. a grudge against Belichick for whatever reason. But I think it was Matt Patricia that uh, is why he didn't want to go there. I think that's the only reason. I don't know if anybody uh, – has another idea of why you want to let go there. No, but. it's a good, it's a good point. It probably is one of it. So Fair. now, so, so now, what do you do if you're the Patriots? Do you? I mean, because I, honestly, I, I just there was an article that came out, I believe, on Nesson this week, talking about how they have reservations of, of bringing back Jimmy Garoppolo, and I have to agree. He's unreliable. It's just let's let's face it. Yeah, he's talented, but he's unreliable, and he completely melted down in the Super Bowl two years ago when he had the chance to put the 49ers over the top, he couldn't do it. it. They need to stay away from this. I'm done with Garoppolo. Okay. It's like, I, I think Watson is going to be probably too much money, you know, uh, but apparently Mac Jones now is on their radar from Alabama. Yep. That's the guy that they're talking about. But again, I mean, you know, if, if you bring back Garoppolo, I think you got to draft somebody high, give him some competition. Definitely, Absolutely. Absolutely. No question about it. And especially with how, uh, I guess, vulnerable uh, Garoppolo is to injuries, you need to have somebody stable as a backup if you're going to have him. Would you consider yeah. bringing Jacoby Brissett back? Because I would. Absolutely. I love that guy. I think he's a tough guy. Listen, Bill. Except he's going to be the starter for the Colts next year. Yeah, he'll probably start for the Colts because yeah, Philip Rivers is gone now. There's a good chance he will, but say if he wants to move on. Listen, I mean, I liked Brissett. He was tough. And when Bill Parcells likes a guy – I'm all in because very rarely does he make a mistake. And I, I just, why not? I mean, he's got athleticism. He gets out of the pocket. Good. It's another possibility. I'd take him over Garoppolo. You know, could I would. we argue that Parcells was maybe a little bit better of a GM than even Belichick? No question. He was no, no question. So, I mean, yeah. So Stafford off the market, no surprise there, but I mean, Look, Watson is still my guy, but I'm still starting to feel it's going to be a long shot, really, at best. I think they're oh, it's definitely going to be a long shot. There's no, yeah. Yeah, it's a long shot. I mean, Jimmy G knows the system. He's Belichick's guy. Belichick didn't even want to trade him three years ago. He wanted to get rid of Brady and keep Garoppolo. Yep. I think yeah, they're going to be all does, over. How, how does, how does Joe feel now that he's been gone? Yeah. So, does, does, Bill, does Bill still see the same interest? Or, uh, you know, I feel, I, I still think, Belichick's interest in Garoppolo, and he feels that he could make him better than what the way he performed. Other, of course, other than the injuries, <clears throat> but I think he could make him perform better in New England. I think so. I mean, you know, Belichick could coach up a guy. Yeah. Uh, that's one thing he's great at is coaching up guys, making them better than they actually are. I mean, how many subpar players do great here and then go to another team and are just horrible? Um, Jimmy G. <laughs> I think he could definitely uh, coach him up uh, for sure. And I think, I think he wants him. I, I think it's always been his guy. Um, you know, as long as he stays healthy, the guy can play. He did make a Super Bowl. He kind of blew the Super Bowl, but uh, he could definitely play. So, and, and he's going to be pretty cheap. You're not going to have to spend a lot of money on him because I don't know if there's going to be a whole lot of interest in Jimmy G. Uh, because of all the injuries he's had. No, definitely not. I just question whether he can really bring us back to the level that we were at. I mean, it, it, I guess it's tough to really kind of, um, you know, kind of put that into account because of the success we've had over the years and the quarterback that we had for a long time. But, you know, is Garoppolo really that guy to be able to bring us back to where we want to be consistently? I don't think so. You know, I mean, he's a decent quarterback. There's no Tom but, Brady. <laughs> no, yeah. no, there's only one Tom Brady. I'm going to throw another right. name out here and see what you think. How about Gardner Minshew? Because Gardner you know Minshew. what? Jacksonville is a mess. They just hired Urban Meyer. There's probably a pretty good chance they're going to take Trevor Lawrence. I think Gardner Minshew has got a lot of talent, and I think he would work out really, really well here. I've seen it. The, the, the Jaguars are a disaster. I mean, let's see. I think Minshew's probably going to end up a backup. You think so? I don't know I if he's, he's going to end up a starter. I think he's pretty good. I mean, I think you I mean, can work with him. Maybe but. some team will give him a roll of the dice. Like, I, I don't know, maybe the Jets or something. But <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if the Pats 
no. would want. I mean, if they got him and Jimmy G to compete, I could picture them doing something like that. Belichick does love competition and training camp. But yeah. I, I'd imagine if they go after any kind of veteran, they're going to still draft somebody and they're going to have some kind of competition. And yeah. I'm all in. If they want to trade up and go get Mac Jones, I'm all in on that one. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, I know the guys had the best receivers in college to throw to really, but I think he's good. He's think good, he's, but again, I think he just needs to prove himself a little bit more. Again, it was kind of, you know, similar to kind of the Tua situation. Tua hadn't really, you know, uh, proven himself too, too much. Didn't really get too much, you know, to really prove himself before he got drafted. Um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, I kind of would want to see Mac Jones do it a little bit more, but I mean, he's definitely a good QB. Yeah, and that's a good point, too, because when you're at Alabama and you're the quarterback of that team, you usually have pretty much the best receivers in the country college-wise. And, of course, when you're going into the NFL, the competition's a little bit more level. So, you know, there's going to be uh, better defenders against your receivers. It's going to be tougher, obviously. So, you know, that's why I like the idea of if you get a Jimmy G, maybe you bring in a Mac Jones, too, and have a great competition in training camp. I mean, we were all looking forward to training camp last year, which, of course, never happened to watch that Newton Stidham competition, because I thought that was going to be a classic battle for that starting job. Uh, but I think if you get like a Jimmy G and Mac Jones competing in training camp, that is pretty awesome. It, it'll have more. It'll draw more interest in training camp. Uh, than there's been in a very long time. Yes, and there's got to get some interest back again. Even if you brought Garoppolo and Brissett back, all right, I still think that's good competition as well because, you know, they both know each other very well. Um, I think personally think Mac Jones is better than Trevor Lawrence. Like, I think this guy might be the best quarterback in the draft. So, I mean, if, they, if they're able to bring him in and you bring a guy like Garoppolo or Brissett or anybody, even even it was if it was Gardner Minshew, I mean, I think that's – that's good. You need competition, and we need some excitement back here at this position. I mean, let's face it. There's only one Tom Brady. I've said it over and over again. He's gone. He's not coming back. But you got to stop moving on now. And I believe that the pressure is mounting on the Patriots because if they don't come in this year with any type of plan, boy, Bill is really going to start hearing it. And oh, definitely. Because Tampa Bay is not going anywhere. If you want to win the NFC, that's the team you're going to have to beat going forward. You can't have another seven and nine year. No, you can't. You know, one year something. transitional period. Okay. You know, you can forgive that. But yeah. two seven to nine years back to back? No. Because this organization is not about being a losing team anymore. It, it th Kraft expects to win. He expects Belichick to win. He expects good talent on the field. He expects to sell tickets at high prices. He expects to fill the stands. A seven and nine team is not going to fill the stands. The expectations are high here. So you're I think you're right, Andy, right on the money. If he fails this year and they go seven and nine, eight and eight, that could be it. It really okay. could. Or he could be on the hot seat for sure. All right, but we have a, a number of props. We're, we're gonna go around the table. We're gonna pick some of these props, have a little fun here. Of course, we have the uh Chiefs and Bucks in the big game coming up this Sunday. Pat Mahomes against Tom Brady. And uh, we're first going to go with the spread. And right now the Chiefs are favored by three points. I picked the Bucks to win, so I got to pick the Bucks spread. So I certainly have to go Tampa. Uh, and let's give a final score, too. I'm going to say Tampa wins 34 to 31. All right, wow. Andy, what about you? Yeah, boy, it's really tough. Uh, definitely going to be taking the over on this one. I'm still sticking with the Chiefs. Only because I again, I just think their offense is so dynamic, is so explosive. And again, I said it last week on the show. How do you defend Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey on the field at the same time? It really is almost a, a losing battle. Um, right. I just, I just can't look. I will. Tom Brady is almost impossible to bet against. I mean, and it wouldn't shock me if he wins. I just think the Chiefs are just—they're so good, and I think their defense is underrated. And they have given Tom Brady problems in the past. If you look at some of the games that he's had, even when he was with the Patriots. Definitely. So, I, so I'm going to go 30 to 24. Um, I'm going to go 30 to 24 Kansas City. But it's going to be a good game. And by the way, you mentioned uh, definitely taking the over. And we'll get to that on our next prop we're going to talk about. But it's 56 and a half. So with that score, you'd actually go under. Under. Ooh. 
Uh, Jared, what about you? What do you think? I mean, my heart says to pick the pick the Bucks, but I think my head says um, pick the Chiefs um, for what's all you, the reasons that Andy. What's just usually said. more I mean, correct, your head or your heart? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for all the reasons that Andy just said, I mean, uh, you know, if you're the Bucks, how do you defend Tyreek Hill and Travis Kelsey and try to contain Pat Mahomes? Um, I don't know. I, I don't see I don't see the Chiefs losing. Um, I'm going Chiefs here. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Andy gave a similar score to what I was going to give. I don't want to give like the same score. Uh, Thirty-one to twenty-five. <laughs> I'll go. Uh, I'll go thirty-four twenty-seven. All right, <laughs> Mike. What do you think? Who's winning well, the game? You know, What's the score going to be? Well, listen. I, I definitely. I. I. I don't think it's going to be. I. I think they're going to go under. I think it's going to be a tight scoring game. I love the thirty twenty-four, but of course, I'm going with Tampa Bay. Um. But do I could I say 35? You know, to, if I'm going to be different, I'm going to go 35 28. So that's that should that's over, right? You said 52. no, that's uh, yeah, that that's is over. over. That's 63 points. So yeah, 63. Yeah, yep. All right. So the over under is 56 and a half. Uh, my score I have 65 points, so I'm clearly over. I think this is going to be a shootout, it's going to be a high scoring game. Uh, Tampa's defense worries me a little more than KC's for obvious reasons, mostly because KC just has tremendous targets like Tyree Kill and Travis Kelsey. Uh, but I do like Tampa's pass rush more than KC's. I think they're going to put a lot of pressure on Mahomes and maybe get him to make a mistake or two because Tampa's pass rush has been incredible the last few games. And their defense lately, especially the last six, seven games, has shown a whole lot more discipline. So I think they'll be at their best. I think the Brady effect will take place and uh, – they won't be able to totally stop KC. I don't think anyone could, but it's going to be a shootout, I think. And it's really going to be all about who makes the most mistakes offensively. Yeah. You know, if Brady comes out and throws two interceptions, I don't know. Obviously, he can come back from just about anything, but it's going to be tough to come back in this game if you make any mistakes passing. But anyways, I got the over. Uh, Andy, your score, you're the under. You got 54. Anything you want to add? No, I, I think I think I actually like that score. I, again, I you make a lot of good points about Tampa. Like Sha- uh, Shaq Barrett has been uh, great, and Jason Pierre-Paul, what a resurgence he's had. Yep. I mean, really. I mean, it, it, he's wow. You know, it's, I, I just think the Chiefs, and again, their running game is good. I just think they have they have so many options. But again, it's tough to. It's almost impossible to begin against Brady. But again. This is one of the best teams he's had to face. There's no doubt about it. Besides Seattle, you know, I think, um, I mean, again, Tom, you said it best. I mean, how do you defend this? I don't think I've ever seen an offense like this, really. I think they're better than the Rams of 2000, of 99. I yeah. mean, I just think they're just – but another thing, too, that gives me pause, too, is all the success Tom Brady has had against Andy Reid. I mean, he has just owned this coach for God knows how long. I mean, really. For the most part, he's had some trouble with Andy Reid since uh, Andy's been in Kansas City, though. Yeah, well, not when in Philadelphia, he just completely right. just, just right. shredded Andy Reid. But yeah, but in KC, right. yeah, different and, story. Yep. And Jared, you got the uh, over. You got sixty-one points. So you're thinking shootout like me, I believe. I'm also I'm thinking shootout. But to be, if I'm being honest with you, I wouldn't be surprised if like if if both teams kind of really stepped up their defense and this was like a. 21-17 game or like a 17-14 game, honestly. You know, if, if that's the result we got, I would not be surprised. You're not going to hold uh, Brady that small. I'm sorry. <laughs> and here's one more thing I want to make, too. We'll Steve see. Spagnola knows Tom Brady. Yeah. I mean, he those two, does. I mean, you can't – and he's from uh, he's from Northbridge. He's a uh, New Englander. Listen, those two Super Bowls with the Giants, he was all – I think he was in Brady's head, really. I mean, now, granted, they had some great players – that cannot be overruled as well. He knows Tom Brady very, very well. That's a good point, too. And uh, hopefully he won't be able to get his head in this <laughs> game. Yeah, but he's, he's got to – You know, sure he, you yeah. talk about KC's weapons. Look at Tampa Bay's weapons. Tampa has weapons. They do. I mean, they got Godwin, Evans, Gronk. Uh, Great. 
Bray, Cameron Bray, Bray. And Scotty then, um, Miller. Scotty Miller. Yeah, and then who was – oh, Johnson. Was Johnson the guy yeah, who he's a came rookie. and made that incredible catch against Green Bay? Yeah. I think that guy is, has a very bright future. He's going to be good. And Tampa think- has the weapons to match KC. That's why I think this game is just going to be back and forth. This is going to be like a Super Bowl that took place six years ago. The Pats and the Seahawks, where they uh, went back, uh, where they just kept going back and forth. I, I think it's going to be that kind of game. It's going to come down to the last play. It's going to be incredible. What's really intriguing about this is both teams have the weapons to make this a shootout, but both teams also have the defensive capabilities to make this like a 17 14 type of game as well. Or, you know, the, the defensive abilities. You they know, do, on, on both but I, sides, just, so. I feel like the offenses are too potent for that. No, I, I hear you. I hear you. I can't, no. you know, I could, it could be low scoring. I mean, it could be lower than the over if the defenses are just playing amazing, but you got to imagine both teams get in the twenties. I hear you. I'm, but, I'm, uh, I, I don't disagree, but I'm just yeah. saying, I wouldn't be surprised if, if the final score ended up being something, something low, you know, if it was both, a 17 to 14 game, I would be shocked. Okay. It's Mahomes versus Brady and it's 17 to 14. That would shock. <laughs> if it's 24 to 20, that I could see that. Maybe. Yeah. And, and here's the other thing too. Like I believe Chris Godwin is the Buccaneers best receiver. I'm personally not sold on Mike Evans. I don't know. He's talented. Don't get me wrong, but I don't know. There is something there with him and Tom Brady. It seems like a few uh, times they've not been on the same page. Evans and, is so good, man. Evans here's is, the thing it, about Evans though. He is one of the best athletic receivers in the league. He can make tremendous catches. He can jump over just about anybody. But he's not the smartest receiver in the league. There you go. That's that's what I'm saying. I just say Godwin. I think Godwin's a little bit better. I think he runs better routes. He reminds me a little bit of Deion Branch. He just – Yeah. He is really – if that guy – if we got Chris Godwin to come to New England, oh, I'm all in. He is so good. Well, I, like, I, th- I think God would stay in Tampa. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, Tampa will probably have Edelman next year too. But yeah, probably. <laughs> and with Godwin, you could <laughs> Belichick would love a guy like Godwin oh, because yeah. you could put him anywhere. They put him in the slot. They put him on the outside. They even have him run end around. So you could put that guy anywhere. Anyways, Mike has some fun Super Bowl facts. What do you got, Mike? Oh, yeah, just, you know, just some crazy stuff because everyone loves to hear the numbers that go with it. And, of course, we know the fans are going to be there. They're at 30% capacity, which is uh, 1,400, uh, 14,000 fans, 14,500 fans, 7,500 uh, vaccinated healthcare workers will get free admission, which I think is really cool. They've got 8,000 volunteer staffers that will be there. Sarah Thomas is the first female referee uh, in a Super Bowl, which is pretty cool. Fifth Super Bowl, Tampa's hosted. Nice being in the Sunshine State. Uh, in 1998, when Tampa Bay was built, $168.5 million. The last renovation, $168 million. Wow. <laughs> so wow. you know, the difference of our money gone by. Uh, first time in 55 years that cash will not be accepted at the Super Bowl. Wow. Go figure. Uh, Is that, a, in, that must be a COVID thing. It, it is all COVID, and yeah. especially with uh, one of the facts that 72% of uh, people in surveys are saying they're not going to host or go to a Super Bowl party because of COVID, which does put a little downer on uh, some of these numbers, like the average calories for a football party. What, what do you think the average calories for a football party? Oh, it's got to be, I don't know, three to 4,000. Yeah, let's go 10,800. Wow. <laughs> wow. And, oh, my and, goodness. And how many chicken wings will be served? Will be eaten, I should say. I'm going to say. Oh. And I'm talking wings, not pounds. I'm talking wings. Like throughout the country? Yeah, for a Super Bowl. Yeah. Oh, Millions. Gosh. Millions. 100 million. 1.4 billion. 10 million pounds of ribs are sold the week of the Super Bowl. 10 million pounds? 10 wow. million pounds. And 28 million pounds of potato chips will be scarfed down. These bad boys right here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. In this part, I, can, I I don't even care about this stuff, but 8 million plus pounds of guacamole. I, I wish you had all the food items you're talking about right there. You could just hold them up. You got the wing, the rib. <laughs> well, hey, well, you know what? Look at this here. Oh, Tom, let me share. Uh, I'll show you this, this great little chat oh. that they gave me here. Is... Uh, 
Can you let me share? Yeah, <laughs> trying to work on that here. All right. So doesn't it let me. So you got wigs. All right. Favorite Super Bowl foods. Twenty nine percent. All right, wigs. you should be able to. <laughs> All right, let's try this. Here we go. So we got twenty nine percent wigs, twenty six percent pizza, fifteen percent nachos, fourteen percent dip. 7% chili, 6 on barbecue. And uh, something that a few people might, I don't know if you guys know anything about beer, but. Nah. 51.7 million cases are sold on Super Bowl wow. Sunday. Wow. <laughs> Is that something? Wow. Money spent on beer inside a wine, hot liquor. Yeah, I mean, it just goes on. 503 million of hard liquor. That's unbelievable. 17.5 million will miss work. The day after Super Bowl, I, I used to love that number because <laughs> I love that number only because that the people would tell me, "Oh yeah, I'm not working tomorrow. I'm taking the day off." It's like, come on. Oh, I've taken the day off it. after the Super Bowl a few times with yeah, the pats are in it. Super Bowl but forty-two. I only do it when I don't have really much to do the next day anyway. Right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> and a lot of people do it. So. Um, again, the COVID being a big downer, you get the uh, uh, the ad revenue, you know, $600 million from Fox Sports, uh, including pregame and postgame. Uh, it, it's going to be incredible. It, it is, everyone remember, we talked, I think, a couple shows ago that the big ads, your Budweiser uh, and Coca-Cola, instead of uh, putting their money towards uh, funding uh, COVID uh, it, uh whether it's vaccines or whatever treatments, instead of putting the money into the Super Bowl commercial. I'm sure there'll be some recognition about that. The, oh, their yeah, names, they, I'm sure, will be dropped. Without a <laughs> doubt. There's gonna, I mean, there's going to be huge commercial. And guys, I just watched, uh, found out today, SpaceX is putting out a huge Super Bowl commercial. They are manning a wow. rocket to go up. SpaceX, uh, Elon Musk, and that other billionaire, uh, uh, anyways, Bezos, uh, Bezos, the Google guy. No, no, no. This guy, no, he, no, he's quit high school, started his own company. I think he's with an F. Whatever. <laughs> anyways, so the two billionaires that get together, they are going to put four people to orbit around the Earth. Four, to, four civilians, no astronauts. Four civilians up in a SpaceX rocket, a couple days around the Earth and back down. Okay. Wow. <laughs> All civilians. They uh, are raising. Are you going to uh, be up there for like a year for that? No, 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 no. Just a couple of days. Just all over the earth. Oh, all right. So what happens is the uh, they're raising money for St. Jude's Children's Hospital, two hundred and million dollars. The one billionaire is giving a hundred million, and he's asking people to make donations. You can go to make a donation to St. Jude's. No minimum. You can make it a dollar. You make it hundred dollars. You make a thousand dollars. Whatever you want to make, twenty-five cents. Your name will be put into the pool to be one of those people on that seat of that rocket. That's really cool. Did you do wow. that, Mike? Uh, I'm doing you it. Going on the rocket? You bet you. I might have to take two <laughs> seats though, like like they make me do on Delta. You know. Well, let me zoom from there uh, <laughs> onto the show. Oh, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll uh, Facebook live it while I'm there. And, oh, my they're, goodness. They're, it's supposed to be pretty – It's that's pretty impressive. So uh, they're, they're doing this here, and they're raising $200 million for St. Jude's, which well, is – It's a great cause, that's for sure. Just absolutely. Yeah. Outstanding. Sure. That's is. cool. So those are some, uh, some cool fun facts that I have. I like it. I like it. All right, let's uh, let's run through some of these props. We got like uh, five, six minutes left. So, all right, what do we think the coin toss is going to be? Heads or tails? I'm going to go. I'll go uh, heads. <laughs> I'm going to go tails because you went heads. All right, Andy. Tails never fails. I was just going right. to say the same thing as Andy. Tails never fail. <laughs> all right. I guess I'm the only one with heads. Bob probably would have picked tails. <laughs> he would have uh, picked a tie. Yeah, he would have. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he would have picked it. It lands like in the middle of the coin. It lands upright. Right. Yes. Yep. There you go. All right. Will the opening kickoff be a touchback? I'm going to say yes. Andy. Yes. Jared. No. All right. Mike. Should it be, but it's probably going to be. All right. Team to score first. Chiefs or Bucks? 
I'm going to go Chiefs. I think the Chiefs score first. Andy. Chiefs. Are we talking touchdown or like any sort of points? Any sort of points. I think it's going to be a field goal by the Chiefs. I think it's going to be a, the Bucks. I'm going to go with a field goal by the Bucks. Or it's going right. to be some random touchdown by like somebody that's not, you know, Evans or, you know, Gronk or Antonio Brown. Really random. We forgot about Antonio oh. Brown. When we were listening. Is he even going to play in this game? Yes. Like, yep. He, he, he is. Rock. He's, He's playing. Play. Wow. Yep. Yeah. Mike, who do you think scoring first? I hate to say it, but I think Kansas City will. And, uh, I just hope the Bucks will recover the appropriate way. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is a yes or no question. Does oh, the Brady, next... watch Brady, Brady will probably score first on a QB sneak? Probably. Oh yeah. <laughs> I actually I put a I, there's a wager here. Will Brady have a rushing touchdown? I think there'll be a QB sneak. So I I uh I picked yes on that. I think both of them could. Both Mahomes and Brady both could. Both of them definitely could. You know, I just hope he doesn't take the safety in the end zone like he did against the Giants. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was one of the worst plays. You uh, know, two years in a row because then the ball went over Manning's head in that Super Bowl yeah. and he got a safety and then Brady got one. One of the worst things I've ever seen. Yeah, let's do that. Will there be a Brady rushing touchdown? I'm saying yes. Andy, what about you? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Jared. Yes. Mike. Yes, for me. Well. All right, we all got yes on that. Surprising. All right, does no the surprise. team that score first in the game win the game? Yes or no? I'm going to say no. Wait a second. You picked Tampa to score first, didn't no, you? No, I picked KC. Oh, okay. All right. Had me scared there. I picked and, Tampa to score first, so I think I'm going to say no because I think KC will win. All right. Oh, yeah, I should just do it by that. All right. Yeah. Andy, uh, you must be a yes because you picked KC yes. to win yep. and score first. And Mike, you say no. Correct. You pick Tampa when KC score first. All right. Does the team that score last win the game? Oh, you think it comes down to that, huh? Whoa. Sheesh. Yep. Yes. Yeah, I think I'm going to say yes on this, too. Yeah. Yes. All right. I'll give it a yes. All right. We're all a yes on that. So that it probably won't happen. Okay. Uh, what's the first score of the game? Is it a touchdown or a field goal? I'm going to say field goal. Field goal. All right, Jared. I want to pick something random. I want to pick like a safety or something like crazy, but no, I'll just be conventional and go with a field goal. Uh, you're not going to. Uh, all right, hey, hey, you want something crazy? Two point conversion. Or actually, oh. you know what? The uh, question was it's a it's field goal or safety is one of the options or a touchdown so safety's covered in the field goal option i should have mentioned okay. that. all right all right so there, okay we all got field goal oh i uh, can't do a two-point conversion <laughs> we can... <laughs> shut up mike we're running out of time all right That's will the last score the game Come will on. the last score of the game be a touchdown or a field goal i'm gonna say touchdown and touchdown touchdown Touchdown. All right, Jared. All right, put me down for touchdown for the first one and a field goal for the last one. Oh, he's changing it up. Switching right. it up. Mike, what do you got? Touchdown. touchdown. All right, there it is. All right, let's see if we can squeeze one more in. We are running at very low on time. Uh, where was the player odds? I probably should have wrote them down. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, let's see. Here, Where's a good one? Will... Brady was favored, by the way, to throw an interception over Mahomes, but I can see why. Uh, all right, here's a good one. Uh, will Pat Mahomes have a rushing touchdown? Yes. I got to say yeah on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, I think we're all a yes on that one. And uh, let's see. All right, longest reception by Tyree Kill, over or under 34 and a half yards? Over. 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 All right, I've honestly, over, over. I've never seen anybody like this guy, and I, I'm not a fan of him, by the way. But this guy, how many plays of over 50 yards is he? What a player! It's he just player. really, it's 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 almost like it's. I've never seen anything like it. He's unreal. He's the fastest guy in the league. Uh, there was a rumor him and Scotty Miller might race at halftime because I think Scotty Miller challenged him to a race. So really? Crazy. Although I put my money on Tyree Kill right now. I would too. All right, we are out of time for Andy Barrett, Jared. Dean and Mike Tarosian, I'm Tom Nappy. Thanks for watching HCAM Sports Talk. Take care and be well.